I'm here in Bern, Switzerland. I was at Keto Live 2022 in um, Burgoon, but I've driven down to Zurich, collected my good lady wife, and moved on to Bern to track down Professor Beda Stadler. Beda Stadler, more correctly. Hi, yeah. Yvonne, nice to meet you again. I'm delighted to meet you again, and, and we met actually physically when we were shooting for the COVID Chronicles movie which you were a, kind of a star of, if we're honest. <laughs> and did you like the movie, actually? Or? I liked it very much, yes. Uh, I saw it only uh, a year later, because I was sick for a long time during COVID. Mm. I had COVID, but I was not sick due to COVID. Mm. I had some operations that were... Uh, COVID didn't kill me, even though I was very sick. Yeah, and you would have been very immunocompromised in your induced coma after an opera, a neurological operation, and yet still COVID didn't really move your needle, even though you were very profoundly ill already. Mm. Yes. Amazing. Well, and you were the, uh, if I remember correctly, you were the director, now retired, of the Immunological Institute in Bern. Right. Yeah, and basically professor of immunology, for many decades and you are known in Switzerland, you're kind of famous as the vaccine pope and that's because you're a real industry guy. I mean you have patents on vaccines developed, you're a real pro-vaccine guy, essentially, generally. We always worked on modern types of vaccine and I had never had a vaccine that was actually used as an infectious vaccine. What, what we worked on were mo modern immunotherapies, which are vaccine-like, and there are now new types of vaccines that will come on the market where we worked on early on. Right, Julia, you, you had original patents on technologies that are now evolving. Very good. But in terms of immunology, obviously, I think you also were referred to as the Fauci of Europe. Uh, so it's just let the audience know the stature of the person that we're, we're talking to. But we won't get too much into that because it's a hot topic. But it would be great to revisit, especially having seen the movie, all the things we said in that first interview in May 2020, I think, uh, which YouTube took down in spite of your position. Anyway, that's the world we live in now. And we also revisited the whole scene of COVID in October, November 2020. Uh, where we kind of look back and, and assess that we were largely correct, particularly ourselves. But now it's 2022 and we can truly look back and all the data's in. So where were you, and, and I agreed with everything you said, so me, uh, correct broadly, and where were we maybe very significantly incorrect? And uh, yeah, that, that would be a great conversation. I mean, the most important thing we said at the time, it was, and that's one thing nobody believed, is it's not a new virus. We said everybody is basically immune. Most people have not enough immunity, but young children are totally immune. Everybody under the age of 10 is protected. Leave them alone, don't worry for them. Everybody under the age of 20 is safe. The only people to worry for are those above 50, but real worry starts above 70. And that's what holds true until today. Your movie has clearly shown that even for places like South Africa, where people live under the most miserable conditions compared to Germany, <laughs> the outcome is the same. Yeah. Or if you just lis listened at the time to all the people who warned for the, from the example of Sweden, they said, oh, what they do, this is so dangerous. And now if you look at Sweden, Sweden is better off than most of all other European countries. If you look at number of deaths per million of people, if you look at this figure, Sweden is most 
is better than most other countries like Germany, France, Spain, whatever, you know. Yeah. You, you have to stay sober and look at this and say, okay, what we have learned is next time we should no more overreact that much. Take it a little bit easier. Yeah, absolutely agree, Beda. And just for the, I can show slides around this data. Anything you mention, I'll put it into the video later. But Sweden is an incredible case of, of a perfect control country. And just in terms of the data, Sweden now, after two years since March 2020, the whole pandemic period, they are running a slightly negative excess mortality or slightly positive, you could argue, but it's null. Now they did get spikes and then they got troughs. So some deaths were pulled forward, but like you say, it has proven to be in a recent publication from the WHO, one of the lowest in Europe, to your point. And yet they had no lockdown, crowds up to 50 allowed, which is big, uh, no masks, except for the odd psychotic, and they had kids in school up to 16 years old. And they were, I believe if parents wanted to take the kids out of school, there were repercussions. They would not let them because they held to scientific principle. And yet they were one of the lowest in Europe. And they have an aged demographic, Sweden do. They have 9,300 deaths per million per year. UK is 9,800, so they're similar. Ireland, 6,300 per million, because we have a young demographic. So Ireland got zero mortality impact over two years. It's, it's astonishing, but I think it validates everything we said. I do want to pick up though on the immunological point. When I went out after our discussion and I was nominally saying around 80% are de facto immune, and I was saying it doesn't mean they cannot catch it, doesn't mean they won't get a bit of PCR, but they're effectively immune because it really doesn't affect them. Is that a, that's a fair kind of definition in a sense? Exactly, and that's what we have to learn and where we have to bring the PCR into the discussion. We have to get away from this type of assay to see whether somebody is immune. The PCR is a wonderful test to see whether we have a virus in the sewage. <laughs> if, if you have it on the table, if, if, if we have it in the food. If you're immune, even if you're totally immune, if you're exposed to a full load of virus, you may have this virus for a whole week in you, but you fight it, you will win. You will never become seriously ill because you are immune. But during this week, the PCR will show positive, positive, positive. Every day you make a test, you will be positive. You will, but you will never be positive. It, it, yeah, if you get a, a, an awful lot of it, you may rarely even transmit it further. But that's... That's like winning in the lottery or so. Of, of course it's possible, but that's not the rule. So let's hope that nobody is so stupid that from now on we will every cold virus monitor by PCR. If we do this, <laughs> then we can shut down all industrialized countries because everybody every winter will be positive for adenoviruses, for rhinoviruses, and for all. We will detect all these viruses all the time, everywhere. The PCR is a wonderful test, but don't use it with this type of, of meaning that it has been done. It's not useful for this. It's good for looking where is the virus, but it's not good for finding out who is really sick and who is not sick. It only says, where's the virus? But it doesn't mean that somebody's sick. Yeah. And to your point as well, transmission can happen in someone who's largely asymptomatic. But Fauci said many years ago, and he's correct to this moment on this day, it never plays a big part in an epidemic 
because it's symptomatic uh, transmission that plays the huge part. So that's all you need to worry about. You know, symptomatic people stay away from elderly frail. That could be the simplest, you know, discussion maybe. Uh, even personally, while I was passed away, I, I was uh, for three weeks under artificial coma. Somebody had, had, had infected me. I, I became positive and I was severely sick, what they said, mm. you know. So I had to be treated by multiple nurses and they treated me very well. And I, every, everything of my body had to be controlled. So afterwards I went to these nurses and I, I thanked them that they looked so well after me. And I worried because I was positive. Mm. Not a single nurse infected was infected through me and there were minimally 20 to 30 nurses who looked after me and other personnel who checked for me and had body contact with me nobody was infected due to me you know yeah. and, and that was very close contact so mm. so and you could say they're wearing these surgical masks, but we know now it's, it's aerosol transmission. And aerosol just laughs at those masks. And we've probably seen the videos with the vapor who just takes one draw and then puts the mask on properly and breathes out normally. And that's an aerosol. And his whole head is, you know, occluded by vape. It's meaningless. So it's a great anecdote. I and mean, we've seen it everywhere. But like, and yet we went through what we went through. All of it was kind of pseudoscience, which you used to fight about for decades. You fought against religion and pseudoscience and quackery. And yet you found yourself in 2020 watching your own profession uh, and, and genuine apparent experts indulging in lockdown mask and immunology quackery, in a sense. Yeah, that's, that's where I lost dramatically lost there which makes me sad because I was for the mask but another reason not that everybody is forced to wear a mask I was always for masks but for those people who believe that they might have it for those people who are coughing for those people who think ah they could eventually yeah they should wear it to protect the others. Be, that they could eventually cough and not be capable of quick enough protect themselves. I said, yeah, for those people, a mask makes sense because a mask can retain big droplets, can re to a certain degree, you know. It, it helps a little bit. Yeah, and, and second, Everybody can see, oh, here is somebody that I should better be more distant. Yeah. I should not go and sit next to him. So the psychological value of the mask was for me also something that those people who believed that they may be positive, that they wear the mask, that those were the things that I wanted. And that has been killed by just forcing everybody to wear the mask and at the end the biggest loss was that people believed so much in masks that they would prefer to wear a mask rather than go and get a shot get immunized that they would think oh the mask is better or equal to to being immunized and and that is the most terrible thing that has happened that people have thought yeah I don't need to immunize I can wear the mask and then everything's okay that that is one yeah potential downside a backfire if you will and again I think the data though from Israel a year over a year ago and even Fauci has admitted it and Bill Gates recently in Davos said you know there's no real point for vaccine passports because although they they believe the vaccine may help with severe disease, they acknowledge now that it has really no real effect on transmission. So, yeah. but, but again, you see, 
that's the whole point. This virus has only had an impact on those which are already in danger. So we only had to care for those who are in danger. So if the, the vaccine decreases the severe cases, that's enough. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's enough. Yeah. And don't go and immunize babies and children. And they don't need it, you know? Yeah, I think though, in fairness, Bed, and it's we've seen this, they move down the age ranges, and now the FDA are negotiating with Bip Pharma uh, for six months to, to four-year-olds. So uh, I think there's something utterly separate from science and data yes. and immunology 101. Yeah. It's a different phenomenon, but we won't we won't go too deep there. And um, just I'm going to circle back to that concept of de facto immunity because. I recently just grabbed the figures for Europe, and you know they went PCR crazy. I mean, they were testing, you know, anything that had a pulse. They're, they even were testing animals, I think, at one point. So they mega tested. But in Europe, over two years and three full seasons, where it went everywhere, we know now it riddled everywhere. Ireland has 1.65 million PCR positives with only 5 million people, right? Now, vast majority were asymptomatic, but Europe, 6% of Europe, the whole of Europe, uh, has been a case, uh, a positive. And that proves exactly your point. You're saying around 80% will just completely be clear, maybe 90. I was attacked and taken off YouTube for saying that. The fact is, after two years and three full seasons and mega spread of a highly transmissible virus, it's been everywhere, only 6% came up as positive. So 94%. And of the 6% that came up positive, the vast majority of that 6% was asymptomatic. So you could maybe say 98% were largely immune. Isn't that astonishing that basic math has now said more after two years than all of the knowledge of the experts. Yes, and in addition, that the, all the experts are also very helpless in that sense that it is extremely difficult to develop an assay that can predict whether antibodies are protective, so to say neutralizing or not. And all these assays that are used all over different countries or within countries. Most of them you cannot compare if they come from a different company, from if they're based, if they're on a different principle, so to say, if they recognize different epitopes. You can say, okay, somebody has antibodies, but whether these antibodies are any good or not, to protect you against the virus is, is not said if you just have antibodies. So we have wasted much time in doing all these PCRs. If we would have invested all these endeavors in developing good immunoassays, mm -hmm. then we could have made a test and said, okay, now we have a test to find out you are at risk or you are not at risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you see how a certificate would you look like? <laughs> yeah, it would be something totally different. Mm. Now we have to have, we had certificates that just said, oh, you're immunized. But the certificate would not say whether you're immune or not. Yeah. So what I was interested in knowing is somebody protected? And if I have a grand, if I would have somebody that I love, that I want to keep, I want to not only know is he immunized, I want to know is he protected. Of course. And this type of assays we need. We don't need more PCRs. We know we should have good immune assays that can discriminate between different types of viruses and if a new type of virus comes that the immune assay can say okay the new type is no danger because 
the major epitopes are the same, it will still be protective and so on. And not every time, oh, PCR has detected a new virus, will it be more mortal and then go and count the deaths in the hospitals? <laughs> That's, that's not science, I mean... <laughs> exactly, that it, it is genuinely, and people would find this astonishing, that much of what we had in the past couple of years could safely be called quackery. Yeah. Because what it did was, or pseudoscience, it took uh, fundamental scientific kind of principles and mechanisms, and it created a, a very misleading and false narrative which is exactly what quacks do. They take something with some basis in truth or, or, or true facts mixed in with nonsense. And that's what we've lived under. And you know, I suppose the T cell, of course, I think you said in our first interview, if we spent more time in looking at T cell immunity, and studies came out quite early in mid 2020, showing a lot of T cell activity uh, in people from SARS-CoV-2, and I think we knew from SARS-1 that 17 years later, people who had SARS-1 still had measurable immune response uh, there, ready to go. So all of this natural immunity, all of the overlap of SARS-CoV-2 with prior coronavirus family, like you said in the movie and their interview, this vast reservoir of human immunity was all there. And the immunologists should have known that, but they all seemed to just ignore that, and everyone just went with the narrative. It was, did you, you had past pupils maybe, uh, who, did they tell you why they, they went along with this stuff that made no sense, or? Yeah, I had different comments. I had young immunologists call me and say, it's good that you, you the old grufti, that you say something. We cannot, we depend on our institutions. If we say something, they may cut our money, you know. So I depend on, on anything anymore, so I can say whatever you say. But what you just said before is important. What actually everybody would have had to do is see, oh, all the children under the age of 10 are protected. Let's look. What are the antibodies? What are the T cell responses in young children that are protecting them so precisely? Let's isolate these T specificities, make them artificially available, and give them to the elderly when they have a problem. That would have been science. Science, <laughs> and at the end, cheaper than all the PCRs. <laughs> yeah, the PCR costs uh, on their own. Well, the cost of this is so big in terms of economic damage and suffering and even deaths of elderly people isolated for months on end and just delayed cancer diagnoses that's uh, probably a tsunami coming in the future. Uh, development of children is well published on at this stage and some shocking figures of IQ progression and reading and mathematical ability having been hammered by lockdowns. Not to mention, I think UNICEF said something like tens of millions of people in more challenged areas of the world thrown into starvation. But I could go on for the next 20 minutes cataloguing the negative or cost side of how the world reacted. But the benefit, we know for a fact, and this is important to catalog, from Sweden, the control country, we spoke about a few minutes ago, and from around 40 published papers and analyses that looked at all the countries and all the counties in America, and never found a single positive correlation between lockdown severity or masks with better outcomes. So scientifically, it is scientific to state that we essentially, insofar as you can prove anything in science, have proven that lockdown has an effect so small, positive, that it cannot be measured at best, and masks the same. So we have no benefit, but a moment ago I just began to list the costs and I, I only touched on them. Is this the biggest mistake in public health in human history? It, it, it has to be, I guess. I'm typical for many people that live right now. Many have given up. 
we I I'm you could the word corona has been cut off the brain and then came covid then covid has gone now that we speak everybody tries to get putin out of his brain or war we we try to get rid of certain bad news and try to get our lives back yes. and and that's that's very uh, that's a situation that's hard for science that's hard for reasonable progress mm. we just don't want to hear it it's yeah. it's an overload and and many and we have so many mass media that have the same tones they all go in the same direction and make it such a massive univocal sound that's most people say oh, I, I can't hear it anymore I I have enough I have enough that is so true Beda and you know what people were willing in summer of 2020 I had many friends but they're not kind of extreme technical people like me but they know me for decades and even though what I was saying then and indeed what you were saying was against the narrative they found it at first hard to believe that all of the experts were wrong because they're thinking well Ivor is kind of never wrong not to be arrogant on technical things uh, if he looks into them not just if he throws an opinion out but if he says I have researched I've gone through the math I've gone through the mechanisms and this is a fact they know I'm not wrong and yet all the experts were saying something else but they realized and um, late in the summer of 2020 with a barbecue and all these guys who are very professional senior people uh, we all laughed at the barbecue at the end of the summer about how I was right clearly those same people a few months later after the vaccine rolled and the second wave which was a seasonal resurgence of a seasonal virus they did change, they, their eyes glazed over, they were already tired of it and it got so political with the vaccine rollout that they found it something they did not want to discuss. And then I realized we're moving on now beyond the scientific process of assessing what happened and learning from it. And you're absolutely right. Now, generally, people don't want to go there. They don't want to go back which means we don't learn, sadly. It's a little negative of thought, but that seems to be the way it's gone. So we have to find a way. How can we work, work up all this, giving everybody a chance without losing its face <laughs> Important. Yeah. To, to, to talk about mistakes? Mm. to talk what did what did we do wrong who 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 was wrong and who can can we forgive <laughs> and uh, you know uh, and there are so many people in there who told everybody that they were wrong and those are the ones that are wrong now <laughs> <laughs> but they also ironically <laughs> they censored and deleted accounts of people who yeah. were correct on every aspect of, like in our original discussion in, in May or June, seasonality. They said no. The WHO in July, and I have the, the bulletin, in J early July 2020, they released an official bulletin, and it was in the major newspapers, and they said the title was COVID is not seasonal. It is unlike flu and it is not seasonal. It is one big continuous wave. They stated that in July when we knew at that point it was seasonal and you could get censored for saying it was seasonal. Now they all admit it was seasonal. But the same applies to lockdowns, yeah. to masks, right? To the degree of prior immunity, like we said, de facto immunity. And I recently went through my September 2020 video, which got 2 million views. It got me a quarter page spread in the New York Times. Uh, they were not uh, uh, applauding me. 
shall we say. They were saying some engineer in Ireland has come out with a video and, and CEOs of companies are coming to us asking, is this video true? You know, it, it got reached. Uh, but it was your, what you had taught me and what everything else had taught me. And I went back to that video and went through it, every single thing I postulated, because most of it was, was predicting what would happen. And I created 13 points on a checklist. And I honestly and fairly went back two years later and I could tick every box. Not, not to be arrogant here, but that, you know, we had Professor Michael Levitt in our movie. Yep. We had Professor Bede Stadler, you know, the, the, the vaccine pope of, of Switzerland. We had Dr. John Lee, the professor of pathology, a truly brilliant man. We had all these experts and we had the Great Barrington Declaration, gbdeclaration.org. 65,000 signatures from doctors and scientists alone, nearly a million in total with lay people. And they said, focus protection, exactly what you're saying. That was October, September, October 2020. All of these people who are correct, but censored, shut down. And now in retrospect, we were all correct. It was like the psychosis, the power of the narrative became like a disease, like a virus that spread everywhere, media, but also academics, politicians, everyone. One should count how many scientists, how many officials have publicly said, this is a new virus, there is no immunity against it. This phrase I have heard so many times. Yes. And every time I said, why do you call it coronavirus if it's new? Why do you call Mr. Miller Miller if, it, if it, you know, even that, they were shameless, you know? Yeah, shameless. You cannot call, give a virus a name if it's new. If it's new, it has no name. <laughs> it needs a new name, by definition. Yeah. But yeah, but I remember t I kept all these clips on my server and they're backed up and shared with groups worldwide. All these important posterity clips. But Tedros said, this is a new virus to which no one has immunity. Yeah. It will cause severe disease. Yes. He stated it. Yeah. And then, I mean, when you think of what was stated, in fairness, and I don't want to just be bashing Bill Gates and all this stuff, but Bill Gates came out repeatedly and he said, early on in April or May 2020, he said, this will not end until everyone, we've vaccinated 7 billion people. Now that includes the babies. He stated that unequivocally. You know what Bill Gates said the other day in an interview or three weeks ago in uh, 92NY, it's a big kind of talk shop in New York. In the middle of a one, long hour, uh, one hour long interview, you'll love this. He said almost verbatim, I can quote, and he said, well, you know, back then early on, we, we, we didn't realize that actually uh, it had quite a low fatality rate and it was mainly a disease of the elderly, uh, kind of like the flu. Uh, and then he said, well, 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 but not exactly like flu. I've got that video clip. Yeah, well, it's a, he said yeah. it three weeks ago. Well, we it, get taken off YouTube for mm -hmm. saying that. The only, the only true phrase at the time would have been if you would have gone public and say, listen, this is a, a normal cold virus that has gone uh, a little bit more aggressive than it should. Nobody's in danger except immunocompromised people. All we need now is as fast as possible a new um, vaccine. Uh, because most people are immune, but the elderly, they have lost immunity. And there is no coronavirus vaccine that's good enough. So we have to develop a new one that's specially designed for this virus, for elderly people that works specially good in elderly people. That's all we have to do. And then the world has no problem. And until then, as per gbdeclaration.org, correct from the start, we do what we can to shield the elderly and immunocompromised, acknowledging it's very difficult to do so, 
but if we can't succeed in shielding them, no idiot would try and shield the whole world. Yeah. What idiot would do that? But that's what they tried instead. So, yeah, so, yeah that's, that's a great point. A targeted vaccine-type technology that will work well in the immunocompromised and elderly, which is a challenge because, as you pointed out in our first interview, it's very difficult to get a vaccine that works well in the people who need it in, for this kind of disease because if their immune system is pretty crab, it's hard for them to get a good response from a vaccine. But, but that was still, as you stated it, that was the challenge they needed to rise to. But they didn't, they got one that didn't affect transmission. And I guess, I guess it helps the elderly somewhat, depending on which data you see. I, I'm not sure, I, I'm not delving into that data as to the effect. To make a corona vaccine to protect children under the age of 10, my dumbest student could have done this. <laughs> I know, it's, it's frightening. And, and to be honest, I, I, I liked when you said 50. Under 50 and without significant comorbidities, you're basically all set for SARS-CoV-2. Under 70 and, and very healthy metabolically, you're pretty much all set. So the vast proportion were all set. And yeah but look what happened you know we in ireland we had masks on school children three three weeks four weeks ago the last few months the new york mayor wanted to force masks on like i don't know three or four year olds it, it just it, it, quackery mm -hmm. we know they don't work but he wants to force them on children so i guess it's quackery mixed with child abuse uh that might be a new kind of category so yeah where do we go from here in one hand it's nice to know that we on our side of rationalists and scientific thinkers and people who appreciate logic and, and ethics, it's nice to know we were correct. But somehow for me, because of the damage done to the world, there's no pleasure in being correct on this one. It's a hollow feeling. I feel frustration and anger more because of the damage that was done. I don't feel any pleasure. I'm happy I, I'm, I was correct on everything. But it's no good because couldn't stop it. <laughs> uh, something new happened where I at the beginning was actually pleased is I was pleased that so many politicians were consulting with scientists. And I said, oh, that's good. That's new. You know, <laughs> usually they don't do this. Uh, but then I found out that that there was a selection of scientists that was taken in and not only a selection of scientists then it was a selection of opinions from scientists and and even that was then f politically filtered one more time so th that is also interesting later on to find out how did that actually work you know was that a good idea to have committees? Would that, would that have, should, should we have had consensus conferences, public ones or something public. like public? Transparent, Transparent. very Transparent. important. Yeah. Where, where all scientists from all sides would publicly discuss it and where the media would be present to attack it and to control it, you know. Challenge it. Cha challenge yes. it, you know. And, and not where everybody would, all of a sudden would be together and, and come up with one opinion where you don't know, where, is it now politically? Is it from the media? Is it from the science side? So a consensus debate, a public, where one could see, okay, the, the suggestion is because the politicians won, you know or the consensus is the scientists won or also it would be transparent why everybody's forced to wear a mask you know yes open debate but again like if you go back carl sagan or, or any of the grades science progresses through debate you know and argument mm -hmm. if you take away open and it by definition it has to be open and transparent secret debates you know get into the realm of you know secret societies and quackery and god knows what festers in secret debates but open debates they are the lifeblood of science 
because only through debate and challenge, and often it can be quite aggressive, and often, you know, feelings can be raised. That's okay, you need a moderator. You need a press, an independent press, to challenge, keep people honest. But you must have debate, otherwise science is, science cannot progress. And I think that's what we saw here. No debate, fire hose 24 seven propaganda, essentially it was propaganda, repeating the same terror message again and again is not news, it's propaganda. And then the censoring added into it. So when you did have debates of the type you're referring to, Beda, there, there were debates springing up, but they got taken off YouTube. Because during the debate, things were said that went against the WHO. So Tedros, who said zero people are immune and it's a new virus, you know, and Bruce Aylward in China, the WHO envoy, he told the West, we must lock down in February 2020. I don't know if you saw the footage. We didn't have it in the movie. He showed a curve, and we might just check the camera there and just make sure we don't, we don't lose this. He showed the curve of China's Gompertz curve that we knew was the natural curve, that was natural. He pointed at it in China with a mask on, big blue mask, all the press there. And he said, look what China did with their lockdown. Like, that's like me pointing at the sun coming up and said, look what I did. I made that yellow thing go up. Ooh, look what China did. And I watched that clip with horror. Uh, and then he said, we will have to do that in the West. Great job, China. He looked at one piece of associational data, the association of a novel lockdown that no one had ever done, associated with a curve which ironically we know is a natural Gompertz, and he said the two were causal. And, and the WHO, I've just summarized some of what they said, they said there was no seasonality, a bulletin. But that group, if you conflicted with them, that was the definition of getting removed from YouTube, if it conflicted. It's funny how insane it was, isn't it, in a way? <laughs> oh, I, I'm going on a bit. You could, my frustration is probably showing a little. <laughs> is there anything else because we want to go back to you know have some more food and relax here and lovely what's the name you can read out the name of this restaurant i can't we are here at uh, at the river r where most people are swimming in the river right now yeah and uh, this was uh, an ancient fa gas production factory oh. which is now transformed into a restaurant and uh, art exhibition and dance and theater location. Mm. So it's, 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 it's a pleasant place. Mm. And beautiful. today uh, it's also a good place to be and to remember there were times when we had too much gas. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly these days uh, it's slightly different than that, shall we say. No, that's excellent, Beda, and uh, I love it here in Bern. It's my second time here. We met in a famous old hotel to record you for the movie. It was Briefly, it, the name? It was in the Bellevue. The Bellevue, a beautiful old hotel. And uh, Burgoon as well, and Zurich. I mean, I, I love Switzerland. They're going to be back. This was a great conversation, and it's, it's great to just recap and uh, a little bit of philosophical discussion there about maybe what we can do going forward, perhaps, unless very bad, powerful, rich people want it to be otherwise, without getting into conspiracy. And you know what I might do? I might pan that camera in the moment when we wrap up, so the end shot will be those swimmers. Uh, and people having a great time in the sun. Thanks, Ivo. Thanks work. so much, Beda. Good man. Good man. Bye now. Yeah. As always, hope you enjoyed that and don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button, all important. And do hit that little notification bell also. And thanks so much to all my Patreon and PayPal supporters. Helps keep me going, that's a key source of income. And with trips to London and all the other work I do, it really helps to keep supported there at some level. So anyone else seeing my material, again, please consider hopping on. The links are down below. So thanks, everyone. And here's the place where you get the non-corporate, non-media, legacy, biased kind of information and data. And I hope to keep delivering that so you can keep enjoying 
getting true insights into what's going on in the world today. Thank you.